I realized that it was Steve-O and Chris Pontius, the jackass guys, they took two jet skis and pulled themselves apart. And they had this uh, bungee type thing in between them. The bungee that they were using broke. I ended up being seriously injured. I was taken out of the water, self-preservation mode kicked in. That's when everything kind of went crazy. It is the multi-million dollar lawsuit against two of the stars of Jackass. I'm going to be joined by John M. Phillips, the attorney representing the plaintiff in this case, and we're going to break it all down. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. So two stars of the Jackass franchise are now headed to trial. And this started with a man named Michael Vincent Segura. He has filed a lawsuit against Jackass stars Chris Pontius and Steve-O, Steve-O, whose real name is Stephen Gilchrist Glover. And he's accusing them of almost killing him during a jet ski tug-of-war stunt gone horribly, horribly wrong. This happened back in Puerto Rico on March 11th, 2018. Someone had asked Vincent Segura at a marina to use his jet ski for the stunt. He complied, and then he actually took a part of the stunt. Now, what happened was the Jackass stars rode away from each other on separate jet skis. They were tied together by a bungee cord, but during the, the stunt, the cord snapped, and it struck Vincent Segura, who was actually in the water between the two watercrafts. It struck him right in the head. There is video that has been released of this event, and it is uh, shocking to see. Ah, oh, it hit Mike. It hit Mike. Okay, okay, hit him. Get Mike, get Mike, get Mike, get Mike, get Mike. Alright, we gotta pull it around. Ow. I hope he's alright though. Yeah, he's bleeding. Now, Mr. Vincent Segura claims that as a result of Steve-O and Pontius's negligence, he has suffered extreme injuries and should be compensated for pain and suffering, his medical bills, and the loss of income, all totaling in the millions of dollars. A judge has set a jury trial for March 7th, 2023. Joining me to discuss this is a very special guest. It is Mr. Vincent Segura's attorney, John M. And John and Phillips. John, it's great to have you here. And Welcome to Sidebar. Good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you, Jesse. So I want to actually start with talking a little bit about what your client said uh, about his injuries. I'm going to play this, and we'll talk about it uh, on the other side. My wife, who must have been terrified, she told me that she, she saw me fighting for my life. As I started to come back into consciousness, they started to explain to me the extent of my injuries. I suffered uh, epidural hematoma, bleeding in my brain. When I saw the CT scans, I understood immediately that the big blood clot had pushed my brain into the center. I also had a C5, C6 injury of a herniated disc. My nerves from my neck to my, to my arms were damaged and uh, I had difficulty using, especially my right hand at the beginning. They had to do plastic surgery on my ear to kind of put it back together. And um, I had to get a craniotomy, which means that they break your skull open, expose your brain, and, and scoop out all this blood. So, John, I mean, that is pretty horrific, the description of those injuries. What can you tell us about what your client has been through and what he's currently going through? So, Mr. Vicens was a air traffic controller before this, and he's completely lost the ability to safely operate, you know, the direction of airplanes. Uh, he has completely changed related to how he is as a father, how he is as a husband. And his, you know, the stuff that we take for granted every day about, about how our brain functions, both from the thinking perspective and the, the ability to control our, our, our arms and, and legs have, have all drastically changed because of the significant brain injury. Now, I want to, I'll get into the legal parts of the case, and we'll talk about that in a, in a second, but how did you get involved here? How did you come to be aware of this? Because my understanding is Mr. Vincenskura had other counsel before you. He did. So, so Michael had uh, 
council. Yeah, it's it's an incident that happened in Puerto Rico. I'm in Florida. That's a little different. And Michael had local council, council that, that lived right there in San Juan. And the case wasn't moving. In fact, it had completely gone stale and nothing was happening. And uh, he reached out to a, a, a local attorney that's a friend of mine that's bilingual. Um, and and Mr. Leon, Jose Leon, my co-counsel, uh, knew us from high profile litigation, you know, whether it's Amoroso versus Trump or or Joe Exotic's case and said, will you go down to, to, to meet the potential new client with us? And we flew down to Puerto Rico and, and look, all it, all it took was seeing the photos and you realize this is, this is a catastrophic injury. I mean, the, the, the ear being stitched back on like a piece of flesh and, and, you know, the skull fracture were, were horrific, horrific injuries and then to hear how it happened is one of the most ridiculous, gross cases of negligence I've ever seen. So before, again, we get into that, one of the most disturbing aspects of his account is that as a result of these injuries, it affected, you know, not only his everyday life, but you said it affected the way that he thinks, right? So my understanding is, didn't he get sort of homicidal tendencies as a result of the brain injury? Can you speak about that? Yeah, it's it. So we were sitting over dinner in Puerto Rico, and and you know it's kind of my job to to get into the the nuts and bolts of what we're going to expect the evidence to show. And he started crying, and his wife started crying, and I started crying as he told me the story about how uh, because of his brain injury, he he had homicidal thoughts about about killing his kids, and 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 suicidal ideation. And fortunately he never did any of it because he realized, you know, kind of this out of body experience was just his brain misfiring and got counseling and, 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 you know, has, has set, has set that straight, but, you know, his brain was misfiring to the point that, that it was telling him to, to, to kill the people he loved in, in life most. He's a great father. And they, and, they, and they said that it's attributed to the injury, right? I mean, there's nothing that was happened to him before or anything after. It was because of the injury. Absolutely because of the injury. And fortunately, his, his counseling and his, his healing has his, his healed that aspect of it. Um, you know, he still has twitches and can't use, can't use several digits on his hand. He's, he's got issues. But, you know, that, that's how that, – those were the darkest days. Um, you know, and here's a guy that was – making a significant living as an air traffic controller who moved in with his, you know, with his in-laws, um, you know, was on food stamps at a point and, and it, it just catastrophically changed their life. It's just how fragile the brain is. It really is. And, and look, so I, I want to go back to the date in question because there were videos that were released of this. This is what happened after the he gets hit in the head with the bungee cord. Let me play this for you. We got hurt. I'm hurt. Why are you guys hurt? Oh, but I didn't lose the tug of war. Oh my god, the rope, the thing snapped and just hit me in the fucking leg. Oh. Okay, he needs to go to the hospital. Okay. We only want to know if this is a real emergency. Like that said that you have. Oh, it's not a fake. Okay. We're doing a documentary. Ah, okay, it's actually happening. You got a head trauma and you had to go to the hospital. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay, so John, it seems right after from Pontius and Steve-O, I don't think they understood the gravity of the situation. Can you walk us through what they what they said after to your client, uh, right after he got hit in the head with the bungee cord, then he starts bleeding from the ear. W- what did they say to him? So, so Michael was in the ocean when this happened. And essentially, Steve-O goes in one direction and Pontius goes in the other direction. And the cord snaps. The whole point was to pull somebody off. Tug of war, whoever came off the sea to first loses, right? That's how those stunts work. Well, it wasn't, it, it, it was a archaic homemade design system. And so the, the quake cable actually snapped off of Steve-O, went flying, hit um, Michael in the head, and then hit Pontius in the leg. So Pontius was worried about his, his you know, his abrasion to the leg and Michael was just the person in the water trying to make sure that the, the sea could, could take off 
despite the waves. And even Michael didn't realize he knew he had been hit in the head, but he didn't know he had this gashing wound until they got him out of the water and realized his, his ear was literally flapping. And, you know, at that point, cause there's, there's video of him on the sea do after the incident. And once they realize, Oh, cause the water kept washing off the blood. Once they realized, Oh, oh this is, this is significant. Um, they got him to the beach and they helicoptered him to the, to the hospital. And, and it was, you know, surgery after surgery after that. So obviously at this point, negotiations broke down. This is headed to trial. Now I want to get into the law of this because it is their position that your client assumed the risk. And I'll actually play something else for you. Steve-O had signed a waiver. Uh, again, I want to play this for you right now. We'll talk about this. Signing our lives away. Where do I sign? Your name, address. Ah, what's your name? doing forms for a long time, man. I know what you need. And I'm going to give it to you. So you see Steve-O signing this waiver. Uh, I'm assuming it's with be able to use the jet skis and perform this stunt. But my understanding is your client signed a waiver too, right? Saying that he understood he was going to be part of this, this incident, or am I wrong? So you're wrong. Uh, what, what Michael signed was an appearance release. You know, it, there was also filming going on. Obviously, this was this was not a, a jackass production. It was their, their secondary project. Um, there, there's been numerous names. I don't know which one it was, Wild Boys or what. But they were, they were filming. And if you'll, if you'll watch the beginning, the first time they attempt this, the CDUs weren't stable enough to be able to pull off the stunt. So Michael, um, who's a, at the time was a near professional surfer and diver, super athletic, his his whole thing was he was going to make sure that the Cedars could take off, um, and then he was going to deep dive out of the shot. But they didn't tell and, him to do that, right? Uh, he was absolutely necessary. You'll see from shot one to shot two that somebody had to get these Cedars um, aligned. And Michael had signed an appearance release to potentially be in the show. He was never going to be in the show. His was just kind of a, a, a facilitator sort of role, but the you know obviously there's a huge difference between an appearance release saying I grant my rights to be on TV versus a liability waiver say you know which you would expect with the Jackass Project, frankly. So, so, so John, just have- to just to jump in for a second, I'm looking at the answer to the complaint, and it says that in this guest performer release that your client signed, it includes a hazardous activity waiver. Is that not correct? I think it overstates it. Uh, I don't think that's that's you know what it says, um, uh, and I'm happy to I'm happy to. If you if you give me a break and or we take a break, I can I can go through it with you, but it, it it's not it's not a liability waiver. That was not the intention. And further, those waivers and releases, particularly under Puerto Rican law, aren't designed um, for 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 situations like this where there's this isn't just you know being injured while being a part of a production. It was. It was a negligent design of a a stunt. It's 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 more than just negligence, you know, performing the stunt or during the the capacity of the stunt. It was it never should have been designed uh, and assembled in this way. Glover uh, again, Steve-O, has said that he told your client to get out of the way to clear the shot. Is that not what happened? No, I mean, where, where does he say it? We have the video, and at no point uh, did he give any warning to Michael. And second, because we have video, we can see that. Third, they needed Michael to be in the shot because they couldn't perform their stunt. They, they tried it once, and they couldn't get going simultaneously without somebody essentially holding the C's, the C-Dews in place for them to go in opposite direction. So they couldn't have performed it without it. So wait, just two things on that. Number one, I'm reading this from, from an answer from uh, Steve-O's representation. Um, are you saying they're being dishonest in this filing? Because again, he's saying he told them to get out of the way. 
Uh, I, I mean, you know, when it when it comes to critiquing, you know, complaints and answers, you do that at a deposition. And we haven't been provided with Steve-O's deposition. We've requested it. It was just since the case was set for trial that, that you know, we're moving to that stage. We'll, we'll let it all come out in court, but I, I love our side. So, so when we say assumption of risk, right, that is a legal defense to negligence. The argument would be, and again, I'm like challenging you on this because I, I think it's a really important issue, is they didn't tell him to be a part of this. They didn't tell him to go in the water and separate it. He could have just been like, hey, here's my jet ski. If I'm going to give it for you, the stunt, if it doesn't work, I'm getting my jet ski back, right? It was his choice to go in the water and be in between them as they did this stunt, though, no? No, and I get it. If if he's run over by a jet ski, right? If this stunt is performed in a way, if the if the if the waves push the jet ski on top of him, that's a completely different situation than almost the products liability situation of them having this rigged up uh, jackass caliber negligent uh, design stunt. I, I mean, there, there's obviously with the assumption of risk comes the concept of comparative negligence, right? So, I mean, certainly a jury could determine that, that Michael never should have associated with Steve-O anyway, because hazard follows him. Um, but then you get into kind of the secondary aspect that this isn't, this wasn't being injured in the ordinary foreseeable course of, of a stunt. It was a, uh, whoever designed the bungee cord whoever designed the stunt created something so eminently hazardous that only they would have known, not Michael, who assumed um, that these stuntmen would perform something, you know, that wouldn't fly off and, and, and crack his head. Who made the bungee cord? Do you know anything about that? So the bungee cord uh, came from a company that's no longer in business. Their production company, as I understand, it, it, as best as we understand, then kind of rigged it up um, with the hooks and the life vests. But are they so they're, they're not liable at this point because you said they're no longer in business? I mean, I guess the question is, how did this happen? Was it the fact that this was just an because I remember I saw an actual prior um, test run of this and Steve-O gets thrown back into the water. It might have been Pontius who gets thrown back in the water, but it doesn't break. The, the, the cord doesn't break. How did this happen? How much is it really the fault of them versus how much is the fault of the maker of the product? Well, the, the bungee cord itself didn't fail. The bungee cord didn't break. It's the, it's the connections that they, that they rigged up. Um, this was not, look, a bungee cord is not designed to, to go between two jet skis. I don't know that that use has ever actually occurred before this point in time. And so the bungee cord in and of itself didn't cause, it didn't fail. It didn't cause injury. It's, it's, you know, what attached the bungee cord to a human, to a jet ski that, that failed. And that was all within the design and scope and use of their, uh, or, or misuse of, uh, of, of their promotion of their stunt. Well, we know at this point negotiations are broken down, right? I mean, this isn't going to a settlement at this point. It's headed to trial. Can you tell us why that's happened? I mean, it seems I've talked a little bit about that Chris Pontius and Steve-O believe that they did nothing wrong and that they, your client assumed the risk. They think they, I'm think assuming they think that they could win a trial. How, why did negotiations break down? Because usually they would want to settle this out of court. Right. And I can't speak to – I've been involved since the beginning of this year, and so I obviously can't speak to – you know, what happened in the years before with prior counsel, I can tell you from looking at the docket and discussing it with my client, as much as I'm allowed to repeat that, uh, that nothing happened. And the fact that this case has been in court for, for multiple years and no depositions have taken place uh, is uh, an indictment on um, the, the justice process to this point. But once you start taking depositions, in uh, pinning down people as to what happened and who designed it and why it happened and who knew what, um, then you, know, you 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 put a you put yourself you put your case and you put a jury in a position to decide what really happened and who's at fault for it.
There was a quote from you where you provide you were help provide this video. You released the video of this incident. You said, "quote We provide this video looking for witnesses and people who know about the creation and execution of this stunt. If you have information, please contact us." So you're still in the beginning stages of this, right? I mean, you still have more information. What are you hoping to learn? I mean, we had to start over. There, there wasn't much done. In fact, when we got the prior file, it was literally a box, and within that box was a bungee cord. Um, I guess the bungee cord that had never been opened. And so, you know, now we opened up the box. We've had some, some, some people look at it. I don't want to go into too much detail. And, you know, I imagine the defense lawyers are going to be watching this too. And so, you know, we had to conduct our, our investigation. We actually sought to, uh, to leave to amend our complaint. Um, and the court said, no, no, you haven't shown, you haven't shown need given the length of time, like, well, our, our problem is, you know, some, some species of legal malpractice that this, that these claims weren't included initially, but, you know, in, until we get into depositions and, and I get to sit in front of Mr. Glover and, and, and figure this out, um, you know, we're, we're still, we're still, we're still in dire need of discovery, right? Absolutely. And I guess the question is, is where you think this is going to go? I mean, do you anticipate it is actually going to get to trial? Do you think that there's a situation where you obviously want to learn more information? What are you hoping to learn from Pontius and Stevo? I mean, what do you think their responsibility is to your client? And I, I know this could be a trial that has big ramifications, not only for them, but for the Jackass franchise and maybe for other franchises that deal in these stunts. Look, when dealing, when calling yourself a stuntman, right, and you, you go to a foreign jurisdiction and say, look, we're going to rent jet skis, we're going to bring aboard staff, and you're going to have an appearance release, and we're stuntmen, we have this professional franchise behind us, and you do that, and somebody gets a brain injury. It's one thing if, if Steve-O or Pontius gets injured and they do this all the time, but they went into Puerto Rico uh, and found, you know, a Puerto Rican, uh, you know, who, who happened to own a jet ski and said, Hey, why don't you, why, why don't you, you know, loan us your jet ski? Oh, by the way, um, we kind of need your help. And, and he's injured. Well, workers comp doesn't apply because he wasn't an employee and, and he didn't, he didn't injure himself. He didn't design this thing. And so somebody has to answer to his damages. And, and given the lack of of release, although we don't think a release would cover this situation, it you know it, it's headed to a jury trial. Certainly, reasonable minds can prevail. But again, we've we've been on this case for seven eight months now and still haven't had a deposition because we've been waiting on the court to rule on and, and set a trial date. And so now we have a trial date. We have, I mean, what nine months before trial. So it's time for some some heavy hitting depositions, and usually once tough questions are asked, uh, the parties parties kind of wake up to what exposure they might they might have. And has Steve O or Chris Pontius have they reached out to your client? Have they apologized, even at the very least, or are they or have they been mostly silent throughout this whole process? I, there, there was a series of emails um, between Mr. Glover and and, and Mr. Vison's that that I, I probably don't need to discuss too much, but they started off pretty friendly. And then um, Mr. Glover was, was, was quite rude and, and manipulative and, and, you know, accused Mr. Vison's of, of kind of the stuff that you see in their answer. Um, but it, 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 it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the Steve-O you see on television um, in these emails. And, and I, I think people will be surprised by them, but, you know, again, it's, it's, it's stuff that'll come out in court. We're going to be able to see this trial. Is it going to be televised? You will be able to cover it here on so, Long crime. Yeah. That, I mean, that's always the hope. That's, that's my problem with my, my federal court cases. You know, I want Joe exotics retrial to be televised too, but you know, federal courts don't love cameras. And so, um, you know, we've got to figure that out. John M. Phillips, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to talk about this really, inc you know, incredible case. Um, I think it's going to be have a lot of eyeballs on it, especially if it ultimately does go to trial. But appreciate you taking the time and breaking it down a little bit more with us.
My pleasure. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us here on Sidebar. Please subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcast. Sidebar is produced by Sam Goldberg, YouTube manager Robert Zoki, Alyssa Fisher as our booking producer, and video editor Michael Deiniger. I'm Jesse Weber. Speak to you next time.